Here we go. One, two, three. Happy birthday, Proudly Asian. Happy first birthday, Proudly Asian. Many more years to come. Happy birthday, Proudly Asian. Thank you for bringing all of us together and for sharing important stories and beating stereotypes. Here's to many more. Happy, happy birthday, Proudly Asian. You've had such a fantastic year featuring the most amazing Asian voices. Isabel, you've done such great work and I can't wait to see what next year brings. Happy birthday again, Proudly Asian. Welcome to Proudly Asian, a podcast series that tells bold and proud stories of Asians by Asians. I'm Isabel Wong, a financial journalist who wants to uncover the many Asian stories around us that are waiting to be told. There's never just one way to look at Asians. This podcast will take you through a deep dive into the life stories, struggles and triumphs of young Asians around the world. Welcome back to Proudly Asian and Happy New Year, everyone! I hope you all had a wonderful holiday season and we wish everyone good health, success and all the happiness in 2023. And you know what? On January 25th, Proudly Asian will be celebrating its first anniversary! Yay! But because next week coincides with Lunar New Year, we decide to release this anniversary special a week early. So those who celebrate Lunar New Year will have time to listen in before you are too busy during the holidays. One year. I can't believe it's been one year and we've known you all for one year. So here I would like to thank all of our listeners, guests and our Asian creative friends from around the world for sticking with us in the past year. It's been truly an amazing year, so stay with us for some special segments we have prepared for this very special anniversary episode. Now it's been a few weeks since we released our last episode and since then I've been taking a break, an actual break from everything. Some of you might know I went to Japan and yes, finally, after years of travel restrictions, I was so, so excited to be able to go back to Japan and have all the amazing food and just, you know, had a really nice chilly winter break. And around Christmas, I checked into an onsen ryokan in Hakone, Japan, and just unplugged fully. Um, did not pick up my phone and basically just did nothing other than taking in the forest and mountain view from the terrace and going into the onsen almost three times a day and it was a nice way to recover from all the madness in 2022 especially since we live in a world where everything and everyone tries to compete for our attention for reasons that aren't that important after all having the time and space to not actively think or worry about needing to do something or be somewhere was really really nice and productive also because when you allow that space Good ideas come to you naturally, but for more highlights or any new things to do and places to check out in Japan, maybe we'll do a future episode about that if you guys are interested at all. And can I just mention the beauty of living in Asia is being just hours away from Japan. That was wonderful. But of course, the year-end period did not come without some unwanted drama, just like the rest of 2022. So right after I finished recording the last episode of the year, which was our Christmas special episode, where we recapped 22 highlights from the year 2022, um, I tested positive for COVID. And it was my first time getting COVID and I got it during my favourite time of the year. Um, so soon after I saw a faint second line on the rapid antigen test, maybe around half an hour later, 
my head just started spinning and hurting. I could feel that in maybe an hour or so, I was about to get super ill. And at that particular moment, I was actually working on some proudly Asian stuff. Um, so it felt almost like I was raising against a virus so I could get most of the proudly Asian stuff done before I collapsed. And by the time I had to lie down, my arms and joints started hurting and I was running a fever. Um, that's when I declared, okay, I am really, really ill. And for the following days, I pretty much did nothing but sleep in bed. But you know, like sometimes when you get sick, after one or two days of sleeping, you would suddenly feel like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm sick of sleeping or staying in bed now. Uh, my back hurts. But that did not happen when I had COVID because I really struggled to get up, to even take medicine and eat. And, and I would become unconsciously asleep within seconds. But I'm so glad it's all over now, despite I'm still having a bit of a cough, which is annoying. And I get tired so easily, which I heard is quite common for people who got COVID. But enough with COVID and 2022 because we are so over them now. Um, as we ring in the new year, another great news for all Asians that just came in last week is of course Michelle Yeoh being the first Malaysian actor to win a Golden Globe. And her speech, oh my god, I am sure many of you probably were close to tearing up um, just like I was when listening to her speech. Um, she talks about the struggles she faced when arriving in Hollywood and how people would be surprised that she spoke English. Sound familiar? <laughs> I love how she said, quote unquote, This is for all the shoulders that I stand on, all those who came before me, who look like me. Giving tribute to all the Asian actors who got told they were not as good as their white counterparts or rejected just because Hollywood back in the day thought Asians did not deserve to take up space and be main characters. I can imagine it must mean so much to so many Asian creators, actors and performers when she told the showrunner to shut up um, so she can finish saying everything she needed to say basically claiming the lost airtime and attention Asians deserve on the global stage with such grace and power. So kudos to Michelle Yeoh. It was a great start to 2023 to Asian diasporas, I'm sure. I really can't wait to see more Asians in different fields getting the recognition that they all deserve. Um, not so much about letting Asians win because they are Asian. It is leveling the playing field without making a big deal out of someone's racial identity or heritage. I don't dare to say this is a sign that 2023 is going to be a fantastic year, but I hope we will start to see more positive news after all the heartbreaking events that happened during the pandemic. Like I mentioned earlier, this is a very special anniversary episode for Proudly Asian. Some of our friends and listeners have kindly sent their birthday messages for us, like the ones you heard in the beginning of the episode. So without further ado, let's hear some more of them. Hey, this is Ben and Linji from the Worst Asian Pod. Hey, this is Linji. There you go. Uh, happy New Year, guys. Uh, what? Why is Linji just looking at me very confused right now? You have to wish her a happy anniversary. Uh, we just want to wish a very, very happy anniversary to Isabel. Happy anniversary to you. No, it's That's happy like, anniversary. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Okay, I don't lose for it. Anyways, um, Isabel, we are wishing you the very best in 2023. Congratulations on getting through one amazing year of producing a podcast. But for real though, you know, congrats. It's one year, damn. Yeah. You made it, but yeah, we miss you. Hopefully we'll hear from you soon. You know, I have your stranger. bottle of Dom Perignon ready for whenever you visit New York City. No, I didn't get a bottle. Though. You don't get shit, man. Oh, what the f Can we curse on this? Yeah, of course. She can just beep it out. Yeah, sure, beep it out. More work for her. Yo, Dom P, bro. Are we making this too long? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I like how I ruined her professional podcast with us. <laughs> Maybe she won't even I put this part in. Anyways, uh, oh. Isabel, in all seriousness, uh, great job this past year. It was great getting to meet you. Um, I'm glad to call you my friend. And I do wish that if you ever do come to New York, I will buy you a bottle of Dom. Like an empty bottle, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was going to say, man, I was like, damn. I just want to wish you a final happy anniversary. 
uh, not too many more happy anniversaries as well. Take care, okay? Have fun over there in Hong Kong. Bye. How Peace. old are you? <laughs> Turn the shit off, dude. <laughs>Happy anniversary to Proudly Asian from your friends over here in San Francisco. I'm really glad we met this year, Isabel, and I hope we can do more collaborations in the future. Thanks so much for all you do for Asian creators out there. Happy 2023 and gong hei fa choi. Talk to you soon. Hey, Proudly Asian. Happy birthday. Keep telling the story of different flavor in Asia. Cheers. Happy one year anniversary. Happy, happy birthday, Proudly Asian. It has truly been a joy watching Proudly Asian grow over the past year. And I remember when I first came across the Proudly Asian page on Instagram, and I was immediately hooked on the message to have our stories and the issues that it's important to us told by our own community with our own voice. Um, I believe I was one of the very first guests of Proudly Asian. And back then, I was so nervous because Proudly Asian was the very first podcast I guested on. And I am also still very new in children's literature. And I feel like we are passion project sisters, actually. But um, Isabel was very professional and asked all the right questions about my own message with Ube Books, which is to celebrate and giving light to the contributions of the Filipino nursing community, um, especially at the time when we were just emerging out of the pandemic. And um, yeah, so over the past year, I have enjoyed many, many episodes from Proudly Asian and it keeps getting better and better. I feel that every time I listen to an episode, it's like having those hard conversations that we should be having with ourselves or with our own families and friends. And Proudly Asian has really created a space for Asians in Asia and in the diaspora where we can find and inform ourselves with things that matter to us. Um, so with all of that, I want to wish you a happy, happy first birthday, Proudly Asian. I wish you more power and I'm looking forward for what the future will bring us. I just want to say thank you again to all our friends and listeners for sending in the message. I probably listened to all the messages multiple times and each time I just can't help but get a bit emotional because I just couldn't believe it's been a year since we started Proudly Asian and throughout the year we had a pretty good run. We had amazing collaborations, we made good friends from listeners, creators around the world and we were nominated for award and also we were featured on the front page on Spotify and Apple Podcasts multiple times. So those were the things that we never expected when we first launched Proudly Asian. So we are so so grateful thank you so much everyone for sticking with us for showing us your support and for giving us your feedback and encouragement throughout the year and we look forward to spending more special moments with you all through proudly asian and in this episode, I also want to take a stroll down memory lane as some of you here are new and have been asking how Proudly Asian came about. So for those who have been around for some time, you would know that I used to work as a TV journalist and becoming a journalist had been a dream of mine since I was about five, given I did not know what working as a journalist meant back then. And as a kid, I would run around with my cassette recorder to interview people. Um, and the recorder was pretty much the only toy that I really, really cared about, that I enjoyed. I would pretend I was hosting my own radio show. And for the longest time, I even wanted to become a late night music show host. So through my 
my teenage years, I was always brainstorming or thinking about projects I could roll out. There were probably a lot of project plans in my old notebooks that never became a reality. And I remember one random project idea being building a car that looks like an egg. I even had sketches of the design and use cases outlined. Um, That's a really random one, by the way. But more often, the projects I brainstormed about were around identities, telling stories of ordinary people, people around us who look like us, or those who we just don't really hear much from. Um, And over the years, I never stopped searching for that idea. I started some and gave up some. The idea of Proudly Asian was spawned out of a notebook, of course, and I did not spend a lot of time coming up with the idea, actually. It just came naturally one day. It's by far an idea that I felt the most connected with. It aligns with my mission of breaking biases and providing a space for all cultures, both Asian and non-Asian, to mingle and celebrate each other. And thankfully, many of you also send us messages and tell us about how the stories we tell on Proudly Asian have given you relief by helping you discover and understand your identities more, either through listening to someone who went through similar experiences as you did, or hearing about a story that's completely different to yours. So that's the start of Proudly Asian. That's how it all began, years of searching, born out of a notebook, and now running as a one-woman operation. And of course, some of you also ask me to talk about the challenges in this episode as this is to celebrate the anniversary of Proudly Asian, right? And with all the exciting moments, of course, there were times when things just felt a bit challenging. So I would like to also use this time to talk about some challenges that we had while producing Proudly Asian. And the first challenge um, that I could think of, um, actually I had a really hard time thinking of challenges creating Proudly Asian because I just genuinely enjoy doing um, what we are currently doing with Proudly Asian. And even we had challenges, I did not feel like um, those were really tough moments. I just really enjoyed trying to solve each challenge that came our way. But the number one challenge that I could really think of is late nights or basically non-existent weekends. Because ever since we started Proudly Asian, it is still a one-woman operation. So essentially, me time outside of my day job becomes Proudly Asian time, which made our Japan break that I mentioned earlier in the episode really, really nice because it's the first time during the year that we weren't actively thinking about work and what we need to do for Proudly Asian And some of you also ask if everything that you see on Proudly Asian, including the podcast, research, social media content, uh, videos and website are all done by me. And the answer is yes. So that explains the late nights and lack of weekends. And I do hope one day I'll have the privilege to have help. But so far, I have also been enjoying being immersed in every element of Proudly Asian and making quick changes that will allow Proudly Asian to connect better with our listeners. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, In 2023, if I have any um, wishes at all, uh, maybe... It would be nice to have more sleep. (laughs) But another challenge that I could think of is, of course, with all the research that went into every episode, um, we also want to make sure the recording experience for guests is seamless because I appreciate the fact that they take the time to chat with us. So we are always conscious about not running over time and stuff like that. But technical challenges are also one of the top challenges we have while producing Proudly Asian. For example, the internet stops working while recording an episode virtually and having to panic, scramble to get back on the internet so the guest would not be waiting on Zoom or online for long. Uh, having to tackle audio and image quality issues for episodes and visual elements. That also happened more than we could imagine. But hopefully with technology continues to advance, we will have more solutions to overcome technical issues. But most importantly, we just need a lot of luck with the recording of every single episode. 
But um, yeah, those are really the immediate challenges that I could think of when you guys ask me about um, what were the challenging moments when producing Proudly Asian. But other than that, it's been a very enjoyable journey and we just really enjoy, you know, how the release of each episode also means that we were able to successfully solve some challenges or put the puzzles together. It's that feeling is just amazing. But now it's time for us to move on to the best of Rapid Fires. In this segment, we'll be highlighting some of the best moments and important issues we highlighted in our signature Rapid Fires segment. So are you ready? You have to be. Let's go. First question. Amber, you don't look that Chinese. You're not proper Chinese, though. I mean, I'm fully Chinese. I've lived in Hong Kong my whole life, and just because I don't look it, it doesn't mean I'm not Chinese. My last name's Lai, and um, yeah, that's it. Do you eat sushi every day? I wish I do, but sushi in Japan is for special occasion. I I know a lot of people think we eat sushi every day, but uh, we do eat Japanese-style like home-cooked meal. Are you here to pick up a food panda order? Oh yes, yes. Can I have one? <laughs> Are you Pakistani? Oh no. And don't say that to an Indian person. <laughs> Filipino food is weird. Shut up and eat, Buska. You speak good English for an Asian. Thank you so much. This is actually a fake voice. It's a TikTok generated artificial voice, just like the rocket voice. And next up, go back to your country. To Chinatown? <laughs> to, where? <laughs> to Chinatown, New York? Like to Canada? To Montreal? Imagine if Nathan Chan went back to his home country to win the medals. Who would be winning medals for you, America, at the Winter Olympics? You have fair skin for an Indian person. Can you say you're Eurasian instead? You book way more jobs that way. I have sadly said yes to that before because mm. I thought no one is going to see, Yeah. you know, when that happens. Like when, when a casting director has told me like, okay, you know, we love your look. I think you're doing a great job. Um, but actually the client is looking for a Eurasian talent and because you don't really look Indian, um, if you re- re- re-roll again and you introduce yourself and just say you're Eurasian, you will get the job. So I've been sitting there and I have said to, in many of my casting things that, yeah, okay, blah, blah, I'm Eurasian. Um, and then it came to a point and I was like, why should I say that I'm Eurasian? Because I'm not Eurasian and I am Indian and this is what Indian looks like. It bothers me. So I just say no. Tibet is basically Nepal. Uh, yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we get this a lot. You know, oh, we must, uh, I brought my friend to taste your delicious Nepalese food. The clue is in the title. The cuisine is actually really distinct from Nepal and the culture and the language and, and everything. There's very little in common between the two places. Because we are first arrived uh, in Nepal. I have no idea what they're saying. <laughs> Complete different country. Obvious to us, but it seems apparently not at all obvious to other people. And you are from Tibet. Namaste. Ah, uh, oh, it's like a delay. <laughs> uh, yeah, namaste. Yeah, it's a uh, Indian and Nepal they use, but uh, we call and uh, Tibet calls it like delay. We, again, we have a lot of people come into our restaurant or to our food stall and they'll, you know, they may have spent time in, in India and make this assumption that Namaste is, is the uh, the greeting for all, but uh, it's not a word that Yeshi would have known at all until he himself moved to India. <laughs> and you are Chinese. Ni hao. Ni hao. My Chinese is better than yours and I'm pretty sure my English is also better than yours. <laughs> Savage. <laughs> and you're from Hong Kong. I've been to Japan. Yeah, and I've also been to Italy. Oh, sorry, you're American. <laughs> <laughs> oh my <laughs> Your English is really good. Uh, I usually thank people and then and then I ask why why it wouldn't be and then they start to sort of blush or get a little bit red. Um, but no, yeah, I, I, I would hope so, um, having gone to international schools and lived in the US for the better part of a decade. 
Are you the boy or the girl? Oh, I hate that question. But I think earlier in my、um, gay life, people would like try to impose these this framework of like there's a there has to be a boy and a girl in the relationship, even if both are both are boys. The beauty of being gay is that you don't have to adhere to the rules of masculinity or femininity, and so you know.、Um, uh, With my, me and my partner, we're, we're both boys. <laughs> Are you related to Genghis Khan? Aren't we all? <laughs> Next question: Burmese food is meant to be cheap, right? I think in general, when it comes to Asian food, Southeast Asian food, being cheap is often be equated with being authentic. Uh, but I think it's important to acknowledge that the, the potential of Asian cuisine and how ultimately it can be harmful if we continue to, you know, undervalue Asian dishes because we think that a certain stereotype that Asian food is fast, it's cheap, it's no frills, like you know. But the reality, I think, is there's so much that goes into it, like the, the techniques that have been perfected across different generations, like you know, different ways, like you know, it's labor, the quality ingredients. I think. The creativity of the chefs, all the restaurant owners, all go into it. So I think if you're paying, let's say,、um, 100 Hong Kong dollars for a juicy burger,、um, why、well, we should not be willing to pay for the same delicious bowl of amazing mohinga? Where are you really from? The cosmos. <laughs> What does that even mean? <laughs> exactly. Where I'm born, where I'm at.、Uh, yeah, I really don't understand that question. Really from. And next up, if you don't look like a woman, you are not a trans woman. Um, like being trans woman is not justified by the way we look. So this is not true at all. I mention a lot about the self identification. We have to ask them how they identify themselves, their pronouns, and things like that. But at the end of the day, we're living in the country where like the stereotypical image of trans woman. Are everywhere and are endorsed by a lot of like governments or like you know、um, company, so they can attract、um, the tourists, the visitors. You're not Asian. You're brown. Oh my god.、Um, <laughs> just have you seen a map? <laughs> India is part of Asia. There's another Asian in town. Are you related? Yeah. So I know already shared that that did happen to me. Um, and I was very confused about how to answer that, but no, I am not related to every other Asian that you see. You're white. How can you be from Japan? Um, how can I? Good question. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> It's a miracle. Thank you, everyone, for participating in the Rapid Buys segment in the past year. We look forward to more. So that's year one for Proudly Asian. I look forward to telling more stories that will give you guys some form of inspiration, healing, learning, or even just entertainment. I hope there will be better ways to connect with our listeners. Not sure how just yet, but if you have any ideas, let me know. And finally, any twenty twenty three aspirations? Hmm. Um, Henry Golding. Whenever you feel like dropping by, proudly Asian, our door is always open for you. But yeah, that's it for this anniversary episode. We hope there will be many more to come. Feel free to send us a DM to let us know who or what topics you want to listen about in our upcoming episodes. Season three will begin on January thirty first with a very special guest. Have a lovely Lunar New Year for those who celebrate it, and take care. That's it for this episode of Proudly Asian. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at proudly dot Asian for more content. We are on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. Leave us a five star review on wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for tuning in and signing off for now. I'm Isabel Wong. Just, just, just.